Okay. Today, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verses 14 through 46. Long section of scripture. I want to uh, warn you ahead of time. I always like to do that with long scriptures because it takes a little extra stamina to make sure we're not losing where we are, right? Even for me, as I'm reading through, if I read through 20 verses, I start finding myself like zoning out a little bit, okay? And so uh, just prepare yourself for a long section of scripture. And I want to really, first off, point out three things before we do this and sort of prepare you to look for three things in the word today. The first thing I want you to do is really about our series as a whole. And I want you to look at Jesus's language about his dependence on another for what he is doing. And you're going to see it come up several times in this passage. Um, really not even specifically what we're talking about as this series, uh, this sermon as a whole, but it is related to what we're talking about in this series about Jesus' dependence on the Holy Spirit. The second thing is just reminding us that that is sort of the, the beginning point for this whole thing, really. Right? We, at this point, for the first few sermons, and we're going to continue to show that Jesus, though he was fully human and though he was fully divine, it says that he relinquished or he turned off or he made ineffective his own divine power and instead operated in this life, in his ministry, in the empowering of the Holy Spirit as a perfect, sinless man, but walking empowered by the person of the Holy Spirit. Remember that. Every time you look at Jesus' ministry, you are not just looking at him. You are looking at him and the Holy Spirit. He's always going to partner with him. So everything he does here and says here, he says with a partner standing next to him. The third thing I want you to pay attention to in this passage is not even so much specifically the words that Jesus says. Although we are going to look at those uh, as we go through this. Look at the reaction that people have to Jesus. And look at the variety of ways that people react to what he says and what he is doing. Okay, starting at verse 14. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks of their, on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you has, keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demons, asked the crowd answered. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you are all amazed. Yet, because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. At that point, some of the people in Jerusalem began to ask, Isn't this the man that they're trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man comes from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, he will he perform more signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. <laughs> Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time, and then I will go, I'm going to the one who sent me. 
You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live, scattered among the Greeks, and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? And thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does. The guards replied, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus goes to this festival of tabernacles, this Jewish festival that people would congregate and move towards uh, the city of Jerusalem. And so there's tons and tons of people there celebrating this festival. And about halfway through the festival, Jesus goes into the temple courts and begins to teach. This was very customary for rabbis and other teachers to do. There was lots of teachings on the Torah and teachings on God at that time. And he goes there and he, he seems to be doing all the things that Jesus normally does. While it doesn't explicitly tell us about a miracle, he does address the fact that they have criticisms about his miracles. And so whether he was doing them at that time, which I suspect he might have been, just as he did everywhere he went, uh, or whether they're referring to something in the future, it really doesn't make too much of a difference. But Jesus is doing what Jesus does at this festival in the city. And as you likely saw, as you looked at these reactions that people had to Jesus, they were pretty varied. And sometimes back and forth really rapidly. You see, there was a group of people, and, or, and, and then sometimes a group of people that would later change their mind, who had very positive feelings about what Jesus was doing and saying. They were amazed. They found it just unbelievable that Jesus was, was, was doing some of the things he was doing and saying some of the things he was saying. And they, they had very positive reactions to him. And there was another group, not so much. There was another group of people who were pretty upset with some of the things that Jesus was doing and saying. And you see them right alongside each other. He's preaching a message to a crowd, and in the same message, he gets these positive, these positive reactions, and in the same message, he gets these negative ones. I just want to highlight a few of those. Some of the positive reactions that Jesus gets from people. In verse 15, it says that they're stunned by his teachings. They've never heard anyone like him. It's just amazing. Where did he get his learning? They're so impressed by him. In verse 25, they begin to talk about, isn't this the, the group of people who said that, or didn't a group of people say they wanted to kill this man? And here he is, bravely speaking anyways. And they sort of remark about Jesus' willingness, or maybe foolishness, to do what he's doing given the circumstances. In verse 40, it says they believe he might be the prophet. That would be the prophet who foretold the Messiah. We know that that was John the Baptist, uh, but they hadn't really gotten that yet because they didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah. But they also begin to expect that he may be the Messiah from this. I certainly would consider that a positive reaction. And then the temple cards that they send to arrest and refuse to. They don't want to. They hear the guy teaching, they come back, they're getting criticism from the Pharisees and the, the Jewish leaders, and they say, look, like, there's no way we can arrest this guy. Like, nobody's ever talked like him. They're completely turned away. On the other hand, 
There are people who are completely repulsed and angered by what Jesus says and does here. They call him demon-possessed in verse 20, right? Because no one's trying to kill you. I think it's so funny that right away after it says there's a group of people talking about the people who wanted to kill him. So obviously there was some talk, but they're accusing Jesus of being demon-possessed. They try to seize him. To kill him. They try to have him harm done to him, but they're unable to. The Pharisees send guards to arrest him in verse 32. And in verse 36, it says that all the people are confused by what Jesus means by, by, by he's going to go somewhere that they can't go. You see, this group of people who is experiencing the ministry of Jesus on all these different levels has all these positive and negative reactions. There's this huge spectrum. And actually, if you look at the life of Jesus, this is literally everywhere in his life. We started this series looking at Luke chapter 4, where Jesus is, uh, after being baptized by the Holy Spirit, he comes to the synagogue and he declares, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. And it says that everyone is amazed. If you go back and look at that chapter, and like four verses later, they try to throw him off a cliff. Literally, back and forth. Jesus gets this reaction of both incredible positivity. People are drawn to him and attracted to him. And at the same time, people are repulsed by him and offended by him. How is it that he could preach one message and get such a diverse set of reactions from people? In this series, we have been talking about Jesus and his dependence on the Holy Spirit. We've talked about how Jesus, though he was fully human and fully God at the same time, that in his earthly life he chose to work within the constraints of being a human being who depended on the Holy Spirit for life and ministry. And we've talked about why that's so important because that is the model given to us. Jesus calls us to live like him and follow him, and he can do that because he's using the same tools that we have through the work of the Holy Spirit. And as we live out our Christian life, and we live for God, and we live for building his kingdom, I imagine that many of us have, or maybe will in the future if you haven't yet, have an experience a little bit like Jesus's in this passage today. Because sometimes when God is working through us or through our, just our basic Christian walk, there's a sense in which we have a tendency to get responses out of people. And sometimes those responses are very positive. There are people who are attracted to our faith as we live it out. There are people who find themselves sort of wanting to know more, wanting to dig deeper, wanting to know what it is that we live for. And on the other hand... There's a group of people who are repulsed by what we live for. The very notion of, oh, you're a Christian, makes them cringe. Maybe you've had someone who was inspired by you. Someone who approached you at work or just a coworker or a friend who said, you know, I, I see what you're going through in your life. Maybe it's in the pandemic and this crazy chaos. I see what you're going through and, and I just am amazed at how you're living with such integrity and so positive in the midst of this. Maybe it's a friend who comes to you regularly for prayer because for whatever reason, they trust you in ways that they don't trust somebody else. Anybody have people who mysteriously and weirdly confide in them, like sometimes strangers, right? Because there's something about walking the Christian life that has this attractiveness to it, the way that Jesus' life and ministry attracted people, that there was something they knew they wanted in him. And people, when they encounter us as Christians, Respond whether they realize what they're doing it for or not, are responding to something in us that they want, that they, they recognize they can trust, that they recognize is, is good, and they want something to do with that. And of course, the other side is true too. <laughs> Someone who finds out you're a Christian, maybe they close up. They see, uh, they see you praying, or they see you reading the Bible, and they kind of walk away. They try to avoid 
that situation. They don't want anything to do with that. Or maybe because of your faith, they immediately assume certain things about you, like you hate people from the LGBTQ community or something to that effect. That's a common one today that we're experiencing. There are people who make assumptions about you because of your faith and they have this negative reaction to you. Oftentimes it can even be in the exact same event. I remember one specific time that I was working at a place that I will not name. And I was working somewhere. I was reading the Bible on my break, my lunch break. And there were several other people taking their lunch break. And as I was reading from scripture, I had one co-worker who wanted to know what I was reading and had questions. And they wanted to ask me questions about my faith. And I had another that as soon as that conversation started, they got up and walked out of the room. Clearly upset with the conversation that was taking place. <laughs> There's something about walking the Christian life that elicits responses from people. Oftentimes positive, oftentimes it's attractive to people, and oftentimes it is something that is offensive to people, even without trying to be. What is it? What could cause such a different reaction from people? The answer, of course, as you might be anticipating, is the presence of the Holy Spirit in us and on Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord that was upon Jesus was with him in this ministry at the temple, standing alongside him as he preached, standing alongside him as he performed miracles. And some people saw those things that Jesus did and were incredibly amazed by them. And they were attracted to him and they wanted to follow him and they wanted to give up everything to be with him. And the same, another group of people would see the exact same thing and they would be repulsed by him and they would want to kill him. Because the Spirit of the Lord is divisive. It has a way of separating. It has a way of being a line in the sand. And there is no middle way with the Holy Spirit and His presence. You're going to find yourself drawn to it or you're going to find yourself repulsed by it. It was true in Jesus' ministry and it's true in our lives today. Jesus would teach and he would have people who followed him from there at that point on. And then he would have another group of people who would leave. And then later on he would teach and he'd have a group of people who started following him leave. We see this exchange happen constantly. Even among the same group of people, Jesus' own apostles experienced this. Times where they heard what Jesus said and they were amazed by it and attracted to it. And yet, other times Jesus would say things and they'd say, no, 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 that's not right. That doesn't make any sense. Like, it's wrong for you to think that way, Jesus. I'm thinking of Peter when Jesus says, I'm going to go to the cross and die. The presence of the Holy Spirit on him is what's causing this. Which makes sense why in the middle of all this, in verse 38, at the end of this festival, he would call the people to him. And he would say, and I want to read it so I don't get it wrong. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. For whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. In Luke chapter 12, I'm going to flip to this real quick. I, there's sometimes I just, I read a passage of scripture and, and then I read it at a different point and I, it's like I have never read it ever in the first place. Luke chapter 12, listen to this. Jesus talking about his ministry. Verse 49 of chapter 12, if you want to look at it later. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you. But division... From now on, there will be five in one family, 
divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Don't look too hard at the person to your left or right there. <laughs> Jesus says here, when he brings the baptism, what baptism does Jesus bring? The Holy Spirit. He says, when I bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's going to separate people. Because a group of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit will be irreversibly drawn out of the darkness of the world. And Jesus showed that in his life. It's not division just to be divisive. It's division because the Spirit purifies and by nature, that means that something has to go. There is no middle ground version of the Christian faith. Yes, there are Christians that are learning. Yes, there are Christians that are growing. We're growing as disciples. Jesus' his own disciples grew in this. But the reality is the perfect version of the Christian faith that we are all supposed to aspire to looks like Jesus. And there is no middle ground in Jesus. There is a division. And everywhere he went, he brought division. Everywhere he went, people were mixed about him. Oftentimes back and forth because they were responding to the Spirit of God on him. And the Spirit of God divides and purifies and changes. The scripture says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It says, don't be conformed to the image of this world. We're, we're okay with that. Be transformed. Harder. We're less willing to be transformed. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, if Jesus' life, and I believe that it is, and you ought to believe it is too, is the pattern for Christian life. Because he operated as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, he was sinless, and so he did it perfectly. And yours isn't going to be perfect, but he is the model. He is the one to emulate. He is perfect theology, the living Jesus. And as you look at his life and follow his life, you will experience, like him, that division that he experienced. What God wants to do in you will draw people to himself and also cause other people to flee from you. And it is a hard life to live, but it is a glorious and wonderful life to live. This is why Jesus said, Lord, the glory you've given to me, I want you to give to them. The reason that you are drawn to Jesus is because you saw the Spirit of God, whether you realized it or not, in and upon a person. Whether it was through ministry in the church, through people who showed you the Christian faith, friends, someone who shared the gospel with you, you encountered the Word of God, but you ultimately encountered the Word of God that transformed a person, more likely than not, and that transformed person attracted you to Jesus. I shared my testimony of coming to know the Lord, and it was exactly like this. There was a group of friends in high school that they were Christians, and I hated Christians. I hated Christians, and I could not ignore these people. And they drove me nuts, and yet I wanted to be around them all the time. And I couldn't understand it, and I do now. I just now am figuring this out. That the Spirit of the Lord rested on a group of people in such a way that it drew a person who hated Christians to them. And the more I hated it, the more I was attracted to it. And I've said that before, that when I came to know Jesus, I came kicking and screaming. I did. Like, I remember that moment. I was so attracted and so in love with Jesus, and I hated it so much. But I knew it was real. It's real. Like, he really loves me. And I'm really, really worth something. And I'm so mad that I was wrong. The mixture of emotions was intense. <laughs> But that's what it does, because that's what the Spirit of the Lord does. And He doesn't just want to do it to you, He wants to do it through you. That we would become a people who 
would pray and believe as the song that we sing goes. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Sing with me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Oh, that we would be those people. And we can be those people. Because Jesus showed us what it looks like that we would pray and say, Lord, may your presence and the Spirit rest on me in such a way that everywhere I go, people are attracted to you. And then everywhere I go, sometimes, yeah, I'm going to experience the sting of persecution, but that's just part of your presence on me. That's just part of it. No, I want to be careful about this persecution part. Sometimes people are reacting negatively to you because you're being a bit of a jerk as a Christian. Be careful. Don't use this to excuse you from being kind and loving and compassionate. We have to be careful about that. But yes, there are going to be times you're kind and loving and compassionate and they still want nothing to do with you. And you can't help that. Don't shy away from letting the Spirit of the Lord rest on you because of that. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are supposed to be people that are being transformed and everywhere we go, the world is transforming around us. We walk in the room and with, do you realize the presence of the Lord is with you in such a way that when you walk into the room, darkness flees from it. There's this story about Jesus walks to this demon-possessed man at the tomb. I'm going to put it in some very non-PC terms, but just bear with me, okay? And the demons see him, and they say, Jesus, first off, they have to, have to ask him permission, which I just love. May we please go into the pigs and throw ourselves off a cliff? That is how afraid they are of Jesus. That is how darkness ought to react to us. And sometimes we're going to feel a blowback because there's a spiritual war. Sometimes, you know, you start walking with the Spirit of the Lord on you and you say every day, Lord, fill me with your Spirit anew. You start doing that, He's going to start firing bullets. Because then, you're, then He's afraid of you. And now He's fighting. 